Hi, everybody. This is Craig Hardesty with Out on Film, and I want to welcome you to our Out on Film in Conversation series. Uh, and today, I am really thrilled uh, to be talking to the team behind All Boys Aren't Blue, uh, which is screening at Out on Film, both in theaters and virtually. Uh, so I want to go ahead and introduce uh, director Nathan Williams. Welcome. Uh, Amara Kennedy, a uh, producer, uh, and Tommy Hopson, who is one of the actors in one of the segments of this film. So thank you all very much for joining us and welcome to Out on Film. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. So I'm excited to be here. So I want to kind of jump in. Amara, you told me a little bit when we had talked before about how we got to putting this on screen. So All Boys Aren't Blue is an adaptation of the book by George M. Johnson. Um, and tell us a little bit about how we got from book to film. So it was actually very serendipitous. Um, in both Nathan and I had worked together um, through AIDS Healthcare Foundation and our Black Leadership AIDS Crisis Coalition, um, which is who I'm affiliated with, as well as George Johnson and I had worked together. Um, and he was very actively a part of a, a number of things that we were doing. And so when George mentioned that the book was coming out, he and I just kind of randomly had a sidebar conversation saying, George, we'd love to do a, you know, a dramatic reading of your book. So fast forward, uh, it actually got time to do it. And I was like, oh, well, I guess we got to really do this now. So what does that look like? <laughs> and Nathan is one of the, the most amazing directors that I know. Um, he can just take something that's in his mind and just make magic. So I called Nathan and said, hey, we've got this project. and we really feel like you are the perfect person to do it. Um, just FYI, you only have $10 to do it, but you're the perfect person to do it. And ironically, Nathan had been wanting to work with George and had, so it just all kind of came together. So we did a call and, you know, ideas started flowing and, and you know, I have to honestly say what Nathan ended up creating far exceeded absolutely anything that I even possibly imagined, that our team even imagined. I mean, he literally took the words and brought magic to them. And then Tommy and the other guys, I mean, it was magic created in real life. And, and here we are today. And, and so Nathan, talk a little bit about that. You wanted to do this project when you look at it. Um, it's, I can't imagine that it's easy to think about how you're going to film a dramatic reading. Uh, so, so tell us a little bit about how you approached it and how, how, as Amara said, how you got us to this point. You know, one of the great things about working with people over and over again, like Amara and I have done, is that we built up a level of trust. And Amara knows when I say, give me a little bit of room, creative room, he knows that I'm, I'm not gonna go too crazy. Um, and so I asked, and just a little bit of clarity, I had just literally, how serendipitous it was, I literally had just finished reading the memoir on my own, in my own volition. It was November, uh, you know, at the beginning of November 2020, and I had vowed not to work anymore for the rest of the year because I powered through that pandemic and rode and, all, and did all this creating stuff, and I just needed a breath. And so just like the universe always has a different plan than we have, and just like clockwork, um, Amara and George called me the very, like almost the very next day that I had finished reading the memoir and said, are you interested in doing this? And so I felt like that was spirit telling me, yes, uh, this is something that you should be doing. Um, and then uh, they wanted to do a dramatic reading. And so I started thinking about ways to make it a cinematic experience. And, and as I said, having worked with Amara for many years now, uh, he trusted me and, and kind of let me go with it. Um, and so really what I wanted people to feel was that as if they were in a Harlem 
art gallery, speak easy, you know, that kind of feel. Um, I lived in Harlem for about 15 years and I wanted it to be intimate, but I also wanted George's words to come to life in some, you know, like cinematic poetry. And so um, the, the first step was hiring these amazing actors, right? So Tommy and I, Thomas Hobson, uh, as he's professionally known, but he's Tommy to me, uh, have known each other for gobs of years and I'm a huge, huge fan of his. And I knew that I, we had just done a table read or something like that and he had killed it and I was like, oh yes, so Tommy Hobson, I'm a huge fan of Pose and so Delon Burnside and then Bernard David Jones, I did not know. And, but now I'm a huge fan of Bernard David Jones. And then of course, my dear, dear friend of 16 plus years, Ms. Jennifer Lewis, when I suggested Jen as the nanny to play nanny, uh, George almost lost it because they had always envisioned their grandmother being played by Jennifer Lewis. And I called in a favor for, from Jen and uh, that's how we rounded out the cast. And then I have to give credit to my director of photography and my editor for seeing the vision. And then all of those pieces came together to see the magic that you, you see on screen. And I am going to let you give you props to to your crew because it is beautifully shot. I, I have to say, it, it is really. I, I was watching it again this afternoon, and I, I, it was just kind of remarkable. I mean, it's just beautifully shot. So give props to. Uh, so our director of photography is Brian Bradley. Our editor is Hasiel McBride. They are the dream dream team. Uh, just they get it and they get my wild and crazy ideas <laughs> and they're able to technically, you know, make it happen. And so, you know, I, 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 I've worked with both of them before, but I, you know, we just get better and better together. And so I'm super excited about our next project coming up. So. And then tell me, as, as you came, came into this, how did you find your way to this project and to be telling this story in this way? Uh, you know, it's, it's um, like, like Nathan said, he and I had done, uh, he had a table read of a pilot of his book. Um, and I had such a good time in that. And he was like, we got to figure out when we can do something together. And I was like, please, uh, because I've been such a huge fan of, of all of the films that I've, I've had the luxury to go see of his. Um, so when he called me, or texted me, I think, it was right before Christmas, and I said, I don't even care what it is. Uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, the answer is yes. Uh, and then later on, I had to go back. I told him like two or three days later, because like I said, it was during the holidays, like two or three days later, I was like, oh, I said yes, sight unseen to something. I should probably go like, <laughs> see what the heck I said yes. Um, but I just, I just trusted him that, that, that implicitly. I was like, okay, great. Yeah, whatever he wants me to do. Uh, I will do it. And of course, as an artist for me, that is like the highest of praise. Also, it comes with a heavy burden because you're like, oh crap, this person thinks so much of me and I think so much of them. And now I want to make sure that I don't, you know, uh, let him down. And so, I mean, and much credit to Nathan. He gave us such latitude, uh, the three artists to really sort of come in as ourselves and not trying to be George uh, and just trying to see how we would access um, you know, that world. And I was like, listen, if you're talking about being black, you're talking about being queer, <laughs> you're talking about, um, you know, like those formative years uh, growing up and figuring yourself out, like, I got it. I, I, I was there. It wasn't the exact same story, but, you know, we and, all have and, our own version. And do you approach, like, you know, kind of feeling like a dramatic reading differently than you would approach some other, you know, another narrative form? Um, to me, it just, it, to me, it felt like, uh, which is funny, you know, Hamilton just won the Emmy last night and uh, Renee Elias Goldsberry was talking about, we should find more spaces where we can marry these two art forms. And to me, it felt like theater. Um, and I, and I love theater and it just felt like, okay, like, this is my, this is, this is three one act plays and this is my moment to tell this story. Uh, um, and so that, that, calm me down. Also, I thought we had to be off book and I was very happy to learn that it was more of a, <laughs> we didn't have to learn all those lines. But yeah, I approached it more like how I would approach a play. Like I was like, okay, you've got to build this monologue in a way that is, that people can follow it. But also that like the, the dips and the, the, there's a rhythm to all of these words. And if you don't build that rhythm right, you'll lose people. It'll get boring. How do you keep the, the build going? Every time you think it's climaxing, how do we come back down and rebuild again? So it was it was really fun. 
And Nathan, I mean, kind of expanding on that a little bit, you know, one of the things that, yes, it's kind of these three almost episodes or three acts of the same play uh, with different people, but you do, I mean, that rhythm and of the language you're able to carry through all three so seamlessly. I mean, how do you approach that as a director to make sure that that rhythm just stays, you know, consistent through all three of the portrayals. Well, you know, that's what, that goes back to trust. George trusted me to adapt the text in a way that would translate to film and, and gave me wide lead way um, in terms of adapting it and, 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 and taking out things and putting things in there and rearranging it so that it did have, I mean, one of the, I think the Achilles heel of any film is if it's boring, right? You know what I mean? Like I, I hate sitting through boring anything. Like I'm a Pisces. That's like the worst thing you can do to me is make me bored. And so um, I wanted to make sure that it had the cinematic beats as if it were written exactly for film. And so George allowed me to take the text and, and put those beats in there. And then, I, I mean, I can't stress this enough, and I'm not just saying this because Tommy's on the, the, the line, but the actors added that next layer of rhythm and they added this next layer of, of subtext and context. And, um, and they got the flow of the text in a way that was really, really just you know, one of those things where you just catch lightning in a, you know, in a bottle and I just had the best of the best. And so they made me, everyone made me look really, really good and really, really smart. So. I, I will interject and just say, he's also very humble because one of the things I did love in our rehearsal, um, cause we had, you know, it's pandemic. So we had to do it all right. through Zoom and, and we sat on Zoom together, he and I, and we read through the whole thing. And he was like, okay, great. I like where it's going. I'm going to cut these lines for flow. I'm going to move this paragraph here so that we get to that description of that thing fast. Like, and I was, and I was sort, I was really sort of amazed because I was sitting there and I was like, you know, I just have to worry about me. You've got three other, you got two other actors and a whole production to worry about. But like, he really understood what to say, what needed to go, how to make it flow, so that it didn't feel like you know, three actors, you know, talking at you. So. Praise, praise to you for that, because you were juggling many, 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 many things. Craig, I also want to jump in here and say, it, I mean, it really, it's interesting that Tommy's saying that, because I think from the very beginning of this process, of this project, it has just felt like brothers working together to tell the story of a brother that we all loved. I mean, because that and, and trust is like the resounding theme that goes within. I remember when Nathan sent um, the kind of the first draft, he's like, you know, this is kind of this, you know, I, I just hope you like it. And my colleague and I who were working with him um, from AHF side, we couldn't even text him that we were just in tears. And like, this is the first draft, like, damn, where are we going from here kind of thing. And I mean, even the choosing of these, I, I mean, Tommy, I, Y'all just blew it away. I mean, it was just magical. So I, I really, it was truly, I, I believe that it was very God sent that this story was supposed to be told in this way with every single individual that was a part of it, you know, um, because it was a labor of love um, and it was a passion project, you know, because Nathan, God bless him and the crew, and these actors were, were navigating COVID and all the COVID protocols in Los Angeles. We had started off with this great idea, like, oh yeah, let's just shoot it in Atlanta. And they were like, nope. They're like, oh yeah, let's just shoot it in New York. Like, nope. And then, and then it was like, this is gonna be easy. Everybody but one person is in LA. And I mean, it, it you see, I mean, this project was just amazing. And how is it, it has resonated with so many individuals, no matter what their gender identity, sexual orientation, racial, cultural background, literally, it blows me away that Nathan almost weekly is sending us texts saying, you're not gonna believe now who wants to see it. You're not gonna believe now who wants to see it. It's showing here, it's showing here. I mean, I remember there was even one um, screening that neither one of us knew about and he was like, did you, did you give approval for this? And we're like, no, like, okay, what the hell? If they want to show it, just show it. You know, so it has just taken a life of its own that just really says that this was something that is so much more than any of the people that were involved in its product and creating it. 
I, I mean, to that, because I will say, you know, part of my reaction to it was, was that, I mean, the language itself is just beautiful. I, I mean, the writing is, is, just, is just beautiful. Um, but so much of what struck me as I was watching all three of the stories weave together is that they're all about various times of being seen um, and being rooted um, and, and having someone have your back. And I think that's something like, I, I mean, like we can all respond to, and I know that all queer kids can, can respond to, you know, being heard, being seen and somebody having your back. I mean, talk about kind of that power of that, of, of the story as that comes out. I, I, you know, this is just another testament to George's brilliance um, because although I adapted the, the text in a way to make it a cinematic journey, I didn't change many words or anything like that. That's all George's text. That's all clean from the, the book. And um, one of the reasons why I loved this memoir so much and why I love this piece so much because it is a counter narrative to, you know, black queerness in the black community, right? We talk about masculinity and the intersectionality of blackness and black queerness, but George's uh, experience with their family and their nanny is count a counter narrative to the often I'd rather have a dead son than a gay son that we often hear that is catapulted in the media right because it's salacious and it's horrible and we need to talk about that too but this is more aligned with my experience my family when I came out was embraced me, you know what I mean? They didn't miss a beat, um, aside from maybe one or two outliers. And so, you know, my mother would never miss a beat, you know what I mean? She's always been my number one supporter. And she, I'm, in fact, when I did come out, she's like, boy, you know, I've known you since you were born. <laughs> and, you know, and so I wanted, and one of the reasons, you know, we, we premiered this with Black Powered by AHF for National Black HIV, African American HIV AIDS Awareness Day. And that's at the core and what Amara's genius was in thinking of doing a piece like this for that particular day is before we even get to talking about HIV and AIDS in our community, let's talk about acceptance and let's talk about mental health and let's talk about identity. These are all things that no matter what your color is, no matter what your sexual orientation is, we all experience growing up and these three vignettes along George's life, I think are universal. And so before we start talking about the, the widespread HIV and AIDS epidemic in our community, let's talk about some of the reasons why we, how we get there. So I thought, you know, AHF and Black and Namara, their idea for this was just wonderful. And everybody from all walks of life can appreciate it because we all go through this growing up. And Tommy, you know, part of it, you know, and I will just say I, I watched it for the second time a little a little while ago just to, to to prepare for this, and and really the arc that kind of anchors with you. Um, I mean, it's really a kind of when when I hear them say, "My mother just told me to smile after that first one," where 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 they don't smile for so long and then come full circle to to growing up and you're being recognized and you're being seen in in this ceremony um it kind of how, how do you get to that emotional place to get that celebratory about you know the beauty of being seen and being rooted and having people with you um you know one thing that we did, because again, like I said, COVID took away our ability to rehearse together. But one of the things that Nathan did for us was after rehearsing with us individually, he let us all watch each other in, you know, in four boxes on Zoom, watch each other go through okay. the order of things. And so I really got to sort of see, okay, this is what we are building to. Um, and that this is the this is the end of it. And so there needs to be a sense of like, the journey isn't over by any means, as we all know, like there's still growth always. But I remember that moment, you know, like I remember the first moment when I felt like I found a community for myself. My family, like Nathan's family, like George's family, my family was very immediately like, okay, yeah, all right, we know, 
uh, what else, you know? Um, uh, and so I think for me that, that triumphant sort of ending for me was very important because I was like, the one thing I wanted to give my parents, because I knew they'd be okay. The one thing I wanted to gift them was me being okay. That I knew that their burden would be me, my health, my safety, my comfort. Uh, and it felt to me like, again, you don't connect directly because I'm not, a, I'm not in the fraternity. I've never had that experience, but I have had the experience of finding a space where everyone just sort of gets me, it locks in and I'm like, these are my people. Uh, and I think that also like the, 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 the underscoring of it is so great because it's building, it's building with it, you know, and then you get to that, that chant, you know, we are George M. Johnson. And I've had so many people reach out to me and say, you know, like, Hey, are you, are you actually a, a cap? I'm like, no, no, I'm not. <laughs> uh, I'm not. I, I, you know, I have a lot of friends that, that, that are Greek and, and it's an experience I have lived adjacent to, but, um, yeah, so that, that's really what it is. It's like, I, I have had as a queer person, as a black person, that moment of figuring out that I am enough and I'm more than enough. And that if you don't get it, that's your problem and not mine. And that is really, I think for most humans, but especially queer humans, that final real hurdle of like, okay, I have to get to a place where I'm enough on my own. And if you think I'm great, Thanks, but you know, but that I know happens with community. <laughs> yeah, but that, that happens with community. It happens with, for most of us, our chosen families, and for, and for a lot of us, uh, you know, our actual families. So Amara, I, I'm curious, as you kind of, you, you know, thought this in the, in the beginning, uh, how to bring this to screen, when you saw it for the first time, what surprised you the most? from when you first thought of even doing this? Mm. Woo, Craig, that's a hell of a question. Um, <laughs> I'm trying to reflect. Well, I will say I was, um, I was really blown away. And this kind of goes to what Tommy was saying of how each of these actors took on the persona of, of George um, and how the story just flowed. I mean, because um, Nathan did tell me a little bit about um, some of the obstacles in you know, your traditional rehearsal style and whatnot, but it just flowed. Um, and I think, you know, I think it was one thing for us to be talking about it, but I think the, 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 the big thing that just blew me away is just how powerful it was. I mean, it was like, you know, because George was very specific about which chapters he wanted to have um, shared. Uh, and it's, I, I, I'm still even thinking about it, Craig. It just, it just blows me away. I mean, because it, it was so much further than um, the initial kind of limited vision that I had. So I, I give all the credit to George for his amazing writing and Nathan for just his amazing vision. And then his team for like putting all the pieces together and then again, these actors, I'll tell you, because I mean, you know, if we were like very truthful about it, it was just this vision of like, let's just do a dramatic reading around it. Like, I didn't really know what that looked like, but I mean, Nathan, and, and the way that Nathan just took ownership of the piece and brought this whole reality to life. And, um, you know, and it's just, it's a beautiful piece. And I think it will resonate for many, many years to come and for many generations to come. Can we talk about the song? <laughs> at the end, I, 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 you know, I, I don't always, and this is probably bad, I don't always get all the way through the credits, but the song started, and I'm like, I'm going to listen to the song, because uh, they said to listen to the song, so I did. Uh, <laughs> where did the song come? It's beautiful. Uh, so and why can't I download it or stream it? <laughs> well, you know, I agree. I, first of all, this, <laughs> this, this whole project was divinely guided. You know, I just want to reiterate where we were. This was the end of 2020. We had three weeks of pre-production. We shot it in one day and I had three weeks to edit it. <laughs> and so, yeah, so that's what we were dealing with. So 
we we <laughs> and and as Amara said, we had like ten dollars and fifty seven cents. So um, so and that was over budget. It was supposed to be ten dollars and fifty cents. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I just said, you know, I, every night I was calling on the better angels to swoop in, and then out of the blue, at, and during the editing process, we get um, Mark Moss, who is was or still is Julian King, who's the the artist and uh, the the song contacted me and said, I have this song called All Boys Aren't Blue that was inspired by the book and that Julian created. And do you want to listen to it? And I was like, sure. I was like, now nah, we ain't got no licensing money. So I don't know what y'all are looking for. And they were like, and Mark was like, no, we just want to be a part of it. And they sent me the song and I literally cried because I was like, how do you get, it's like, it's almost as if, I mean, technically Julian wrote it as an inspiration from the book, but had no idea we were doing a film dramatic reading, had no idea that that was coming down. Um, it was going to go on an EP, which hasn't been released because we're still in quarantine and, and Julian can't promote it. So hopefully soon it'll come out on an EP or whatever, but that song is so beautiful. And I tell people, I'm like, do not cut off the credits because it, <laughs> it buttons up the entire film and it, it, it just, it brings it home. And it was just like, again, in. the angels came in they were like here Nathan here's another gift <laughs> <laughs> but praises to Julian King and Mark Moss and their team for swooping in and like you know it came Amara that wasn't in like the first couple of cuts it came towards the end and like I had to shuffle to get a you know a licensing deal done and we did and we we put it in the film and I can't imagine the film ending on it with a different song yeah. it's so perfect I mean, it, yeah, it just, it just really is. Um, I, I, you know, as we kind of think about it, I think, you know, I'm always one, I, we, we do a festival, I believe in film and I believe in art and I believe in queer stories. Um, and as artists, I think you, part of what you do is always with you. So I'm curious, Tommy, what part of George are you going to take with you from this project? Um. You know, I think George and their story came along at a really interesting time in my life. Uh, you know, I, I, I know and Nathan and I had, had spoken about it um, before and after that, like, I was just in this space in my career where, like, everything was almost happening. <laughs> and I was just kind of like, you know, sitting in a pandemic. I'm from L.A., so I was like, screw staying in my own place. I'm staying at my parents' house. You know, so I'm in the suburbs with my parents, kind of like, what what do we do like what's going on and then this sort of came to me and i i had i had decided years ago i did a show for nickelodeon called the fresh beat band years ago um i spent the very first season of the show only telling my fellow lead actors about my sexuality uh, i was 25 26 years old and i was just like i don't know the world is i mean this is in like 2009 <laughs> so i was like oh my god i don't know and so I told them, but I told no one else. And for a year I used they, you know, uh, that beloved, um, you know, pronoun that people use when they are scared to say he, uh, you know, at least for me romantically then. Um, and season two of the show, I came back and I said, okay, we're gonna be together for a while. So I'm only doing this once, everyone come over here, I'm gay, okay? And like, <laughs> this is, you know, and, 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 I, and I think that, I've grown up so much since then, but this experience and everything that's come after it has reinforced the idea that I am only at my best for me as the artist that I am when every part of me comes to the table. And so I'm currently doing a TV show where I am a heterosexual father who's got a wife and two kids. And someone asked me in an interview the other day promoting the show, well, that must be so nice that Nickelodeon, because I'm back at Nickelodeon, that they let you do this. And I was like, that's interesting phrasing. They didn't let me do anything. I showed up with my talent and that wasn't part of any discussion that was had. And they hired me to be me. And, and once I got to set, I immediately was like, and here I am, this is all of me. This is my partner, this is my life, this is everything. And so you get to, and I will say it's been one of the greatest experiences in terms of our showrunner is a black straight man He's very clear with me that like this role is partially based on him. And he's just like, it's never once been a thought. Never once did I think 
this person can't do this. And I was like, oh, I think George and George's story for me as an actor was the culmination of the idea that this is part of my narrative and whatever comes going forward, this will always be part of my narrative. I want kids and adults, if they need it, to be able to look around and find me and say, if he can, I can. And I think that's what George's book is doing for queer kids all across this world. And that's what I'm hoping I can pay forward with my own. That was a very long answer, I apologize, but that's- No, no, and I, I, I just wanna quickly add on to that. You know, Guru Oprah, Empress Oprah has a quote that says, you know, if I had known being my authentic self would make me this rich, I would have done it a lot sooner. <laughs> I, and, I, and I just posted a thing on Instagram about Little Nas X and the, the night his, his album came out, I cried because never in a million years did I think we would be in this space. And I think that that is the growth of what's going on right now in the zeitgeist, right? Pushing people to be authentically ourselves and unapologetically ourselves. And that's one of the things that George's memoir, and I believe this piece and why it's resonated with so many people is it encourages all of us to live unapologetically as ourselves. And that's true freedom. That's really the, the, the crux of what freedom is. And, 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 oh, sorry. I was gonna say, and thank you to Nathan because listen, I'm an actor, so I can be an insecure mess. And Nathan showed up that first day and Nathan was like, what is going on with you? Cause I was like, was that good? Was that, did I? Cause everyone else has these things and everything. And he was like, you are so good at what you do and I need you to just know that, like everyone in this room. And I was like, you know what? Yes, I keep showing up into spaces, apologizing, showing up into spaces, feeling like I have to prove to everyone in this room that I deserve to be in this space. And I, I don't know if he did it on purpose, but I appreciate forever that I walked in that day, took my COVID test, passed it, was sitting there thinking, oh, we'll probably film in order. And then Nathan came over and said, you're up first. And I was like, <laughs> Oh, you know, you walk the walk. And uh, so thank you for that. Well, that was a little strategic. Now, no offense to Delon and, 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 and uh, Bernard, but Tommy had crushed it so hard in my rehearsals with him that I knew he was going to set the tone uh, and the, the level of what I wanted from everybody. And so it, it's so ironic that you came with some insecurities and then you made everybody else insecure because you crushed <laughs> it so hard. And I knew that, you know, as a little director, you know, strategy or whatever, but I knew that it, it, Tommy was so clear and firm in his interpretation of the text that I wanted to hit it out the park from the beginning and it literally set the tone for the rest of the day so that was that was on purpose that was because you were fierce <laughs> and, and, and Imara as, as you've kind of been through this process and, and kind of working you know to, to help bring this film to life what's What's part of this that you will always carry now with you? Who me? I was gonna start with Amara and then come to you. Okay, go, go for it. Um, one, always trust your gut, to trust the process, and to know that everything that we do each and every day is, or should touch someone's life and has purpose. And Nathan, what will you what will always be with you after this experience? You know, oh, I, I just got a little verklempt. Because <laughs> like Tommy, um, you know, I've been in this business for over 15 years. I, you know, I started off as a producer and entertainment lawyer, and um, I made the pivot um, at the young age of 38 to start writing and directing. And so I have never gone to film school. You know, I've, I've, I've read probably more books than anybody that has gone to film school and, and studied a lot and, and did my own film school. But, you know, I, that comes with some insecurities, you know, that comes with some insecurities about, is it, do I have a place directing and writing? Um, and this project for me will always mark the pivot from that insecurity to understanding and being confident that not only am I supposed to be doing this, but I'm damn good at it and I have a vision and I can execute the vision that I have in my mind. So this will always 
be near and dear to me because it was a pivotal moment. Because if you can, if I can create this in the middle of a global pandemic, and if you remember in January of 2021, it had resurged. Right. If I can do this and this, I can do anything. So it will always be a pivotal pivotal project for me and my confidence as a director and as a filmmaker and as a content creator. Um, and Imara, I wanted to give you just as our remaining moments um, to talk about the, the organization that, that is partly responsible for this, a AHF and Black. Can you, I, I'm going to give you a little bit to talk about the importance of these organizations. So thank you. I, I appreciate that, Craig. Um, so big picture, AHF, which stands for AIDS Healthcare Foundation, is now the world's largest nonprofit public health organization that has a primary focus on addressing the global HIV AIDS ep epidemic. So we're in 45 countries and domestically we are in 16 states, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And our commitment is very simple to provide cutting edge medical care and advocacy, regardless of one's ability to pay. So what that means is that if someone tests positive today, first of all, we make a you into care in no more than 72 business hours and to not let financial barriers be a barrier to keeping you and getting you into care and the quality care that everyone deserves. And Black, which is the Black Leadership AIDS Crisis Coalition, is an initiative of AHF that started about seven or eight years ago um, with the understanding that when we really look at the current HIV AIDS epidemic, that it is disproportionately impacting communities of color, particularly black and brown folks. And so really it's an initiative that started as a for us by us, meaning that it was formalized and created by the leaders, black leaders of AIDS Healthcare Foundation to more deeply integrate this work into the black American community. Over that period of time, it has now grown to really be a coalition of ambassadors and leaders of every level within the Black American community that are not only committed to doing this work and moving this work forward um, in a very impactful way, but really we've grown to really have the work of Black being around Black empowerment within the Black community. Um, it, and, and that's why this project is so deeply connected to that, because again, if we don't have a community that is about self-love and self-empowerment, then coming right in talking about HIV and AIDS, you know, you might as well be talking to the wall um, because it's about how do we love each other? How do we love ourselves? And really, how do we continue to build a community? And not that our brothers and sisters of any other cultural or racial background, you know, are not loved and important, but there's a specific lens on the critical work of love, empowerment, um, that we as Black folks need to do within the Black community. And so that really is the, the work and the power of what Black is committed to under the lens, as we say, powered by AHF. Thank you. Uh, Nathan, Amara, Tommy, I want to thank you all for joining me for this conversation. Uh, I want to thank you for bringing this film to Out on Film um, and our festival and our patrons. And really just thank you for your voices and telling this story. Thank you very much. Our thank pleasure. You. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you.